Welcome back to Off the Deep Path. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for February 22nd, 2024. We are broadcasting this week from the Reconstructed Rebel Department here at the Georgia Historical Society on the 15th floor of the Jepson House overlooking beautiful Forsyth Park in downtown Savannah. My guest this week is historian and author Elizabeth Varon. Liz Varon grew up in Virginia and earned her B.A. with distinction in history from Swarthmore College and her M.A. and Ph.D. from Yale University. After teaching at Wellesley College and Temple University, she moved to the University of Virginia, where she is currently the Langborn M. Williams Professor of American History. She is currently serving as Harmsworth Visiting Professor of American History at Oxford University in England. Liz's research specialty is the Civil War era and the 19th century South, with a focus on political dissent and discourse. She is the author of many books on these subjects, including Armies of Deliverance, A New History of the Civil War, published by Oxford University Press in 2019, which won the 2020 Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and was named one of the Wall Street Journal's best books of 2019. Her other books include Appomattox, Victory, Defeat, and Freedom at the End of the Civil War, published by Oxford in 2013. Disunion, The Coming of the American Civil War, 1789 to 1859, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2008. Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, The True Story of Elizabeth Van Loo, A Union Agent in the Heart of the Confederacy, published by Oxford in 2003. And We Mean to be Counted, White Women and Politics in Antebellum, Virginia, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 1998. Her latest book, and the one she is talking about with me today, is entitled Longstreet, The Confederate General Who Defied the South, published in 2023 by Simon & Schuster, and it is getting rave reviews in national publications. Liz joined me from Oxford to talk about James Longstreet and her new book. My conversation with Elizabeth Varon begins now. Liz Varon, welcome to our podcast. So glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You have written a biography, uh, the first in quite a long time, about James Longstreet, who uh, we claim here in Georgia. I know that uh, he was born in South Carolina. If you will, for the benefit of our listeners who may not be as familiar with him as as you are and as, as I am, uh, can you give us a thumbnail sketch of who James Longstreet was? Sure. I mean, he's best known as a very, very important Confederate general, really second only to Robert E. Lee, Lee's right hand man in the Army of Northern Virginia, which is the most important Confederate army. Uh, and and, uh, uh, you know, a, a successful general uh, in, in, in many battles, um, but a controversial one because he at the end of the war, uh, 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 you know, war ends and his standing as as a Confederate hero in the eyes of white Southerners is is intact. Um, At the end of the war, in the early days of Reconstruction, he has a sort of political about face, a turnaround. I call it in this book, the the most remarkable political about face in American history. You know, that's debatable, I suppose, but it's hard to think of a more remarkable one, which he embraces Reconstruction and Lincoln's Republican Party. We'll come back to all of that. In any case, that political uh, about face um, is makes him uh, vulnerable to to uh, criticism, the target of some very, very uh, sort of hot tempered criticism from unreconstructed uh, Confederate uh, rebels, ex ex rebels, um, who is part of a political backlash against his his political change of heart essentially cast him out of the Confederate military pantheon retroactively and blame him for the South's defeat at Gettysburg in particular. He had famous disagreements with Lee about the strategy and tactics for that crucial battle. Uh, But they blame him really even for the Confederate defeat in the war uh, at large. And they charge sort of retroactively that perhaps his his uh, his sort of military malfeasance was traceable to a, a lack of will. His heart hadn't been in the cause, this this kind of thing. So this leads to a litigation and endless relitigation that begins in his own day and carries down to the present day of his military record. Do, you know, was he, uh, you know, incompetent or insubordinate at Gettysburg? Does he deserve blame as a scapegoat or maybe the principal scapegoat? 
for Confederate military defeat. Military historians have debated this endlessly. No one will ever get the last word, needless to say, because the source record is complicated. And I know talking about sources is one of the things we, we have on the docket for, for today. So um, people have a sense of those basic outlines of his story. I was really struck as I read about Longstreet, a sort of Southern maverick. I have a, I, I'm interested in sort of dissenters and mavericks and people who depart from the the, the sort of well-trod path. I wrote a biography of a woman named Elizabeth Van Lu, who was a white Southern spy for the Union in Civil War Richmond. Um, Longstreet, a, a maverick. I, I was struck as I as I read and reread his story that while we know a great deal about those, you know three important days in July of 1863 at Gettysburg um, and, and, and a great deal about his military record, again, with, with uh, various verdicts, largely negative verdicts having been offered over, over the years. We knew relatively little about his nearly 40 years after the war as a political operative for the Republican Party. And again, to you know, remind your listeners, the Republican Party in this period is the party of Lincoln of emancipation, of the Union war effort, of Black enlistment, of the enfranchisement of Black men, of Reconstruction, in other words, a party of all that white Southerners were taught to sort of loathe and fear. Longstreet's embrace of that party, his career as a sort of iconoclastic critic of his own society, his career as a quite canny politico, holder of many a patronage post, attempt uh, a, a, a man who attempts to build a Republican party in places like Georgia, in the face of a lot of opposition, uh, all of this I felt had gone, um, you know, s sort of uh, un understudy, and uh, and and that you know, furthermore, Longstreet he has a bit of a reputation for having been a kind of gruff and and surly man, a few words. He was, uh, I found him to be a, a sort of voluble, prolific man who left behind a sort of vast body of work of political thought speeches, dispatches, letters, 690-page memoir, and so on, all of which I felt uh, we, we, we needed to analyze it, uh, uh, you know, closely. So the, in a way, the goal of my book is to take a relatively familiar figure, certainly familiar to Civil War buffs, and reintroduce him to the public as someone um, who, who we, we don't know nearly as well as we might have imagined that, that, that we did. You uh, are a biographer. You mentioned that you have one under your belt already before this one, and you're working on another one. Um, I had a, the great good fortune to work with William McFeely yeah. as a master's oh, student. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you know, wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning biography. Yeah. B.S. Grant. He told me one time that he found it impossible to think about writing a biography about somebody with whom you didn't in some way empathize, that you felt not if you didn't feel the connection. Would you agree with that? Did you have a connection with Longstreet before you started this, or did you create one? Did someone come uh, through yeah, your research? I don't, that's, I mean, I, that's an interesting perspective, but, but I, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's necessary to have an empathetic connection. I think what you need is a deep fascination uh, and a determination to to get things right. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't. I was. I, I, I in no way wanted to seem to rehabilitate Longstreet. I have no no interest in that whatsoever. What I wanted people to do was to to grapple with this the complexity of his story um and 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 to uh, uh you know to, to understand the nuances of it and and he's a particularly compelling subject because he lived this long life uh all the way from 1821 to 1904. So his his life is a window into the origins of the war, the course of the war itself, reconstruction, the post-war period, and the memory of the war, and into things that continue to royal American society, race relations, political polarization, uh, debates about memory and memorialization. He's he's sort of living all these topics in in real time. And and so I was I, I felt passionate about the the work, but but the passion was about was about uh, you know getting to the bottom of the story, solving some puzzles, uh, and 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 using sources to solve those puzzles. And the puzzle at the heart of the story is why does he have this political turnaround? Um, uh, you know, he, he and I felt that that was something that his previous biographers hadn't spent enough time thinking about, hadn't explained adequately. Um, 
you know, uh, uh, again, no biographers ever, ever going for an absolutely definitive uh, explanation, but you want the, the one that is best sustained by the sources after a careful consideration of them. Um, you know, I, I, I was, uh, it, it, Longstreet ends up in some very compelling ways fighting on behalf of Reconstruction. And that's that's something that I think was was admirable. But uh, but it's important to note, um, you know, before he gets put on any sort of, you know, sort of a metaphorical pedestal that that his first choice was for the Confederacy to win the Civil War. And that and that if it had the, his remarkable turnaround wouldn't have been possible. So I would say in a way this is a good way of coming full circle in your question about McFeely, you know, for me. I did feel an empathy and a sympathy for a person in this story, but that person was U.S. Grant, who, mm. who is Longstreet's good friend, and 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 without whose intervention, Longstreet wouldn't have made the about face. You know, so so uh, um, you know there there is a in a sense Grant is is a hero of Longstreet's story, um, if you will. Uh, so so I mean it, it it's it's a great question to ask. Um, you, you need to have a, a deep fascination with a biographical subject. You don't have to like them, uh, I think, empathize with them, you know, uh, uh, you know, have the impulse to in any way defend them. But you have to have a, 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 a dogged and almost maniacal determination to get to the to mm -hmm. get to the, you know, to, uh, to the bottom of the story. You uh Longstreet's life breaks down, it seems like, very naturally into three parts. Often biographers have to sort of artificially do that yeah. in order to, to get, drop a net on their subject. But his breaks down into the Civil War hero, the Reconstruction, controversial politician, and then his involvement, as you mentioned, in reconciliation and his place yeah. in Confederate historiography, if you will. Right. Did you um, – were you at all reticent? I know you're a Civil War historian. Um, but were you at all reticent to have to wade in because you had to to wade into the whole yeah. Gettysburg mess and, and try to, you know, piece by piece, tell us exactly where he was on the second day yeah. and what he was thinking as best you could tell? Because you really can't write about Longstreet without confronting that business first, right? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I was conscious of, of the fact that there's been a great deal of writing about that, including some very good writing, particularly by Jeffrey Wart, a previous biographer of Longstreet, who focused on his military career, wrote a terrific book, Simon & Schuster book, with my press and my editor, you know, uh, so I was, uh, I'm a big admirer of that book and didn't feel I had to, I had to, you know, reproduce it. So I, I drew on what I consider to be this kind of state of the art uh, uh, you know, uh, wisdom, but I, I was I was drawn to re-encountering the Gettysburg story with a particular goal in mind, and that is to tell the reader that which they needed to know about Gettysburg in order to make intelligible the discussion of Reconstruction that was to follow. So, in other words, I was aware that my my contribution opportunities for an intervention here in Longstreet studies had to do with Reconstruction, with this post-war period that had been understudied. And again, that 40 year career, some of which it really is sort of completely missing from the Longstreet uh, uh, literature. Um, but the particular cha narrative challenge was to say, OK, uh, uh, you know, what what does the reader really need to know? And I ended up, you know, concluding that what the reader really needed to know about Gettysburg was that, as you put it, in, in the moment, Longstreet's own sense of things was that the delays and, and decisions that for which other people would later take him to task, he felt in the moment were made to maximize the chances of success, not to not to not to bring about defeat. You know, secondly, that in his own in the moment accounts of the battle, he stressed his ultimate deference to Lee. He didn't agree with Lee's plan. He would have, again, you know, famously preferred uh, to fight on the tactical defensive, to dislodge from the unfavorable low ground in front of Cemetery Ridge and, and move to the left of the Union Army and get between it and D.C. and invite the Union Army to attack the Confederates in a sort of Fredericksburg style trap. Um, he was disappointed. Lee didn't see things the same way. Um, but... Uh, uh, ultimately, he deferred to Lee, and that and that was his that that was you know with with some regrets. But you know, to me, it seemed quite clear 
reading Wirt and others, that Longstreet did not deliberately sabotage uh, Lee's plan, as some of his mo more vociferous critics claimed, but that he was ambivalent. And there's a big gap between, you know, ambivalence and, and you know, the charges and accusations of sabotage. And then the third thing I thought that it was really important for my readers to know as they waded into the post-war period was that at the end of the battle, in the summer of 1863, fall of 1863 and beyond, right through to the end of the war, um, in the eyes of the Confederate public, in the eyes of the Confederate high command, in the eyes of the Confederate press, in Lee's eyes, Longstreet was not a, a, a major scapegoat for the loss of uh, Gettysburg or for the, the turn that the war took. There was plenty of blame to go around at Gettysburg and various people uh, uh, come in for for blame, Jeb Stewart, of course, and Ewell and Lee himself and so on. Um, you know, but 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 long the 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 the, the targeting of Longstreet is he who bears, you know, soul and even primary uh 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 you know uh blame uh is 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 I think part of that post-war political backlash that he he his his reputation as Lee's right hand man survives the war perfectly intact. And that and that should tell us something about about the motivations of those who would attack him later. And it really it seems like it all is it's they were looking backward through the lens of his post-war reconstruction Republican politics. And they said, aha, yeah. now it all makes sense is what happened on yes. July 2nd, right? Correct. That's exactly right. And 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 you know, there the, the, there are plenty of smoking guns, and one of them is 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 a timing that the, the, these uh sort of acolytes of Lee's Jubal Early and and uh um and Pendleton and Venable and 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 others level the charges against Longstreet for insubordination in 1872, 1873. These are the very years in which Longstreet's at the height of his power in Reconstruction, Louisiana, and the, and, and the, the sort of, you know, fullest extent of his Longstreet's own political radicalism. He'll have a sort of retreat, as you suggested when you broke down the three parts of the book. But but that's no coincidence. They 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 disapprove of his politics and see him uh, therefore, as a as as a you know lightning rod, um, and and as and as an easy target. Going beyond the uh, official records of the War of the Rebellion, as they're known officially, those hundred and twenty something volumes of official military records. How difficult was it for you, as a biographer and a historian, to get underneath all those layers and discover the person of James Longstreet? Correct me if I'm wrong. There was a fire at his house in Gainesville yeah, many years later, and I don't know right. what percentage of those archives were destroyed there. What's left to learn? I mean, not not what not to learn, but how did you discover? How did you go? Yeah, about it? It, it, it is it is a challenge, you know, uh, uh, because many of his personal papers were lost. Many survive in archives, uh, you know, around the country. We mentioned uh, uh, Georgia archives. Um, uh, you know, UNC, UVA, Harvard, uh, all kinds of places have bits and pieces of uh, Longstreet correspondence, for example. Um, so it, on the one hand, challenges, yes, there's we, there aren't private papers or diary or journal entries in which he says, here's, hey, here's why I had the political about face. You know, I had to do what historians do, cross-reference, um, uh, you know, read from proximate sources, sometimes read back, sometimes read into always with as much, you know, in, in empiricism uh, as 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 was possible. But biographers do have to speculate and make connections. The reader, you know, kind of deserves and demands it. I realized this with Elizabeth Van Lu, you know, as a biographer, you've gotten uh, up close again, not in an emotional sense, but in a clinical sense, you know, as close as you can to these people. And 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 uh, and you have to, um, you know, you have to venture your best your best theory and your best interpretation best uh, based on the sources about what what makes them tick. You know, fortunately, there are a ton of Longstreet sources. Longstreet, the private man, a little elusive again because of because of the the, the lack of extended journals and diaries. But Longstreet, the public figure, as I put it, you know, produced a vast body of work and and and. That included things like newspaper interviews that he gave many, many of, you know, that he loved to lean into and sort of pontificate on the issues of the day. Um, you know, there are quite a few wartime records of his letters to Lee and others uh, uh, in which we get a sense of his morale. I mean, that's a, an, another sense in which I, 
I, I welcomed the chance to revisit the war was to think not so much about tactics and strategy, which weren't covered so well, but about ideology and morale. And, and we can tell a lot about his ideology and his morale from existing wartime sources, speeches he gave, letters he wrote, and so on. But the, part of the point of the book is that in his post-war life, he is very much a political animal and a public figure. And, and, and uh, you know, we have the probably the most important thing to note, again, for your readers, is that at the end of the day, we have this 690-page memoir, uh, most of which was a defense of his wartime record, but there are some other sort of telling passages uh, in there, praise for Grant, criticism of Lee, reflections on, on the kind of uh, Achilles heels of the Confederate war effort and so on. Um, you know, so ultimately, I, I felt that there was a, a, you know, quite a vast source space, but that much of it really had to do with Longstreet, the public man. And that that was fine because Longstreet, the public man, was what interested me most. I, I, I uh, you know, th this is in part a book about Longstreet, a symbol, Longstreet, a cipher, Longstreet as someone onto whom people's political agendas could be projected. And Longstreet is someone who projected his political agenda onto others. Uh, and, and and uh, you know, to me, this was important. The portrait of him that's come down in previous biographies is, is as a man who was politically inept, who, who didn't mean to appear radical, who, had, you know, who, who got out over his skis, you know, as we might say today, and allowed himself to be painted as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a dissenter and a, and a radical and a challenger of the lost cause in ways that he, he wasn't deep down inside. I, I think that that's just wrong. He, he, he makes a commitment to the Republican party in 1867. He has multiple off ramps, but he doubles down and doubles down in ways that are extremely surprising. And, um, you know, proves to be quite politically savvy. And one of the sort of premises of the book, this is a general conclusion from my study of Grant and Lee and others, is that, you know, you don't get to be a, a powerful general without having some political skill. And and I I I, I thought that Longstreet showed a showed a, a sort of great deal of political savvy. So he he was all in on the Confederate cause. He was yeah. all in on secession. Um, you even make the point, as other biographers have, that he um, accepted a commission into the Confederate Army before he had officially resigned from the U.S. Army. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I know Jeffrey Ward says was, you know, he translates honor into dishonor at that point. So he's yeah. all in throughout yeah. the entire thing to the very bitter end. He's all yeah. in. And then in 18, so he accepts defeat at Appomattox. He um, he wants to turn the page. He yeah. accepts um, that the Republican Party is in the ascendant and that it is best for white Southerners to accept what the Republican Party is doing in terms of emancipation is here. The reconstruction policies of uh, enfranchising black men is here. In 1867, he comes out and he accepts that. What makes him different? He followed the same trajectory yeah. as all these other people who not only went yeah. through the war and then became even more bitter. They became right. lost causers, right? right? And the heart of the lost cause is that we, we didn't really lose, and our cause was as just as the unions or the United States right. or whatever, however you want to phrase it. So what makes him yeah. different? What was he drinking that no one else was? Yeah. So, I mean, there, it, it, there really, the, the way I ultimately sort of explained the turnaround was to say it's a convergence of factors, not, not one. One backdrop, to be sure, is um, that his family had a very difficult war, of course, thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of families did. So I'm not saying that this alone explains things, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. He lost three small children to scarlet fever in the space of one week in 1862, really changed his personality, he became much more sort of brooding and fatalistic uh, at that at that point, much more inclined to brood about the costs of the war the, the, uh, 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 and, uh, and, and uh, the sort of human mismanagement and, and over the course of the war, I think we see, you're right, he's all in from start to finish in the sense that he wants the Confederates to win and is doing all he can to see that that happens. But he does become bitter over the course of the war, what he considers to be uh, Confederate flaws and mismanagement, particularly on the part of Jefferson Davis, but, but also, you know, he begins to doubt the commitment of the Confederate people. Uh, to the cause, and he focuses in his post-war writings, we see hints of this already even during during the war and wartime writings, on the sort of theme of hubris or arrogance. The Confederates uh, 
underestimating their opponents and the cost of that of that arrogance. So that kind of brooding mindset um, sort of predisposes him to ponder, you know, defeat in a way that some others don't. He begins to ponder defeat and the theme of hubris, not coincidentally, when he's out west in the Western theater and face him off for the first time against U.S. Grant. So the thing that makes him special more than anything is that friendship with U.S. Grant. In some ways, Longstreet, I, I sort of imagine him as a man who had sort of two mentors on his shoulder. One was Augustus Baldwin Longstreet, his fire-eating secessionist pro-slavery uncle. And on the other shoulder was U.S. Grant, his West Point classmate, you know, best friend. Wives were friends. Families were friends. The war disrupts the friendship. But at Appomattox, the men have a have a a a sort of a, a kind of meeting of the minds of, of the kind we sort of romantically have ascribed in the past to Lee and Grant. I tried to dispel that myth in an earlier book, but Grant extends this hand of fellowship to Longstreet and to the Confederate Army. He, he, you know, he's magnanimous because he wants to change hearts and minds and affect repentance and atonement. Uh, Longstreet thinks the world of Grant, the, the men have a personal reunion at Appomattox in which Grant essentially says, you know, I'm paraphrasing, hey, Pete, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's be brothers like we once, we once were. And Longstreet sees in all of this just a, a, a moral vindication of, of, of his friend who has also experienced a military vindication. And, and this predisposes him to think about the connections between those, those two things. Um, so he, uh, Grant becomes his political pole star after the war and Grant undergoes his own journey. Grant was no abolitionist before the war. He comes to accept uh, emancipation and black enlistment during the war. And then after the war, he comes to accept the need for for black suffrage. But that friendship sets Longstreet apart. And then finally, and this last piece of the puzzle is really crucial because the story wouldn't have played out in the way it did without this. Longstreet chooses to settle in New Orleans after the war. He, th he conceives of it as a place at, in which there'll be a lot of business opportunities, not the only Confederate to, to, to make that calculation. But New Orleans ends up being this this site of this sort of incredible political experiment in which the Republican Party is very assertive, in which it has a a class of Afro Creole leaders, uh, black men of French and Spanish mixed race, often descent, reflecting Louisiana's complicated, you know, colonial history. Men who are Union veterans, many of whom are are were commissioned officers in the Union Army. There were relatively few Black commissioned officers, but most of them came from this Afro-Creole class in Louisiana, uh, some of whom had been free before the war. Very impressive men, men who have identities as soldiers and as officers, men who play a very large role, men like PBS Pinchback in Louisiana's Republican Party. And Longstreet, um, in ways that surprise everyone, comes to see these men as allies, to admire them, to work closely with them. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, again, you have to put all the pieces of the puzzle to understand Longstreet's decision. We, we have to sort of picture him, 1866, 1867, he's looking around the landscape of the post-war world. Andrew Johnson is president. He's excessively lenient to Confederates. He's, he sort of stokes their defiance. They uh, regain control of the Southern states. They impose something very close to slavery on African-Americans. There's massive anti-Black violence in the South. There's turmoil and division. And what Longstreet wants is peace for his family. He wants peace and prosperity. And he looks around and says, well, who, you know, who can offer that? Uh, and he really believes that it's Grant and the Republicans who can offer peace and prosperity. And when he decides, and you put it very well to, to say, you know, go public saying, hey, you know, the union won, uh, that's that's a credit to, to, to their cause and the superiority of their cause. And we owe it to ourselves and to our society to make the best of this new order. The reaction of ex-Confederates is so furious. You know, they call him Lucifer, Judas, you know, they wish he died in the battle of the wilderness and so on, that it just, it just, uh, for him, vindicates the idea that these ex-Confederates don't really want peace. They just want to fight the war now through political means. 
you know, when what he wants is peace and tranquility. And again, to understand the depth of that desire on his part, you have to understand the personal loss, the friendship with Grant, the 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 promise of this New Orleans setting, uh, and, and and all of those other factors. So I mentioned that you you had to get down in, into a little bit in the weeds uh, uh, um, in talking about the second day of July, yeah. eighteen sixty three. You had to go through that. Even more impressive to me is that you had to get down in the weeds with the Byzantine politics of Louisiana <laughs> during Reconstruction. Did you know yeah. anything about this except on a really general I mean, level before? I didn't it's know a lot about it, but the one thing I knew, I knew it was worth getting right, and here's why. So I told you I wrote a biography of a Southern white Southern Unionist named Elizabeth Van Lu, who, who was a spy for the Union and for U.S. Grant in Civil War Richmond. One of the things that fascinated me about that story was the struggles of the Republican Party in Virginia after the war. So Congress comes along in 1867 and validates Johnsonian Reconstruction, which had been a disaster, again, full of turmoil and violence, enfranchises African-American men and starts this experiment in interracial governance in the South. The idea is that the victorious party, the victorious country should govern uh, and a coalition is formed that includes newly enfranchised black men some uh, white northern transplants, usually Union soldiers to the South, and then some white Southerners like Longstreet willing to give the Republican Party a chance. So that coalition struggles from the start, and it struggles mostly because ex-Confederates, uh, Southern Democrats, they sometimes call themselves large C conservatives, refuse to accept the legitimacy of those those uh, governments Congress set up and, and just assaulted them in a, in a sort of uh, you know, storm of propaganda and violence from the start. Uh, uh, so so that's the main problem. But a second key problem, and I saw this in Virginia and then saw it again in Louisiana, is that um, that coalition, Republican coalition, lacked coherence. There were fault lines within it because the various component parts of it, these are people who have different ideas about freedom and equality. African-Americans in that coalition wanted full inclusion in the polity. Uh, uh, the full full plate of civil rights, of political rights, economic opportunities, social equality, and and so on. Uh, you know, so, uh, some of the the whites in the coalition really wanted economic modernization, uh, law and order. You know, as they defined it, stability, personal profit, but were not sympathetic, uh, particularly to to the aspirations of African Americans. There were Elizabeth Van Lu, the spy, wrote a biography of was 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 uh, quite radical on the issue of race, but many of these Republicans weren't. Longstreet himself is an interesting bellwether in the sense that he was not a, a racial egalitarian by the standards of you know Charles Sumner or Thaddeus Stevens, let alone a Fre Frederick Douglass or someone like that. What Longstreet wanted and imagined his vision of what this the kind of governance that this Republican coalition would do was a system in which African-Americans were junior partners. They could vote. They, they could hold some limited leadership positions in deference to whites, but they would basically be junior partners in a white Southern run Republican Party, a Republican Party that would modernize the South and that would that would, uh, you know, uh, generate generate uh, profit and economic development. Um, what's so telling about Longstreet's story is that even this limited challenge of his to the racial caste system, again, he's not he's not arguing for for full rights or for full power sharing. Even this vision of African-Americans as junior partners is considered far too radical by those large C conservative Southern Democrats who oppose him, because what they envision is a South in which African-Americans have no political rights whatsoever in which they don't vote, they don't have a voice, and 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 they are, you know, sort of uh, consigned to a subordination as close as possible to slavery. So, so you know, the Byzantine politics of Louisiana reflected the fact that 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 you have this this uh, complex political spectrum where 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 even the republic, their divisions, even among the Republicans, divisions which the Democrats seek to exploit. Their propaganda and violence, the purpose of it is, is to suppress black voting, but also to drive a wedge into that coalition by sending the white Southerners in it the message that, that they ought to come back into the fold and that and that and that, uh, you know, they should abandon the Republicans.
Longstreet, to his credit, maintained those views throughout his long life. As you mentioned earlier, he he died, I think, in January of 1904, and he was a Republican yeah. to the end. Um, I think that it's yeah. safe to say he maintained those views even about African-Americans really until the end. It seems obviously so he comes out of the war. He accepts defeat. He accepts of uh, the rule of Republicans as legitimate and yeah. their goals as legitimate. The 14th, 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment, all OK. Yeah. But then he crossed the line by criticizing Robert E. Lee. Right. Yeah. For many people, that was that was the trifecta. That That's what yeah. really did it. Talk about yeah, that for just a little bit. Yeah, that's exactly right. So. So I, I should I should mention briefly, because this is really in, in a way the heart of the book, the the hopes for reconstruction come crashing down in September of 1874 when white supremacists called White Leagues, sort of Louisiana version of the Klan, essentially attempts a coup and attacks the you know lawful state government, Republican state government of Louisiana in a street battle in New Orleans in which Longstreet leads a interracial state militia of which he was the the, the commanding general against, uh, you know, insurgent insurrectionists, white leaguers who are trying to overthrow the government. And and while the the they succeed temporarily, order is restored by the federal army, but it sort of marks the beginning of the end of Reconstruction in Louisiana. Eventually, federal troops are removed from, from uh, that state and from the South and Reconstruction falls and, and, and a one party white democratic rule uh, is reinstated in the South during the long Jim Crow era. So Longstreet at, at that point, um, it feels pretty battered by this experience, the way the way that the Louisiana experiment, you know, is eventually undermined and, and crashes down. And he then we enter the Georgia period of his story, and it's a hugely important part of his story. And this was something that was re previous biographers really rushed through, though, though chronologically, you know, Longstreet spends decades in Gainesville, Georgia. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a place where he has uh, kin and roots and in, in, in which he 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 uh, begins to build a new, uh, essentially a new political base. So in this Georgia period of his life, to, as a little connect, connector to what you just mentioned, he remains a committed Republican. He wants to build a Georgia Republican Party. He he continues to support black voting. Uh, uh, African-Americans make up the vast majority of Republican voters in Georgia. He promotes black office holding. Um, but his main priority in that those last Georgia decades of his life were to defend his military record against this, this concerted attack by uh, ex-Confederates and, and particularly those who want to elevate Lee as a sort of faultless, you know, saintly marble, marble man who could who could be blamed for nothing. So Longstreet goes to battle with his critics um, in a series of essays, speeches, interviews in this vast memoir. Uh, and in the memoir, uh, he he, you know, issues a, some pretty stinging criticisms of Lee. Um, he, he sort of kid gloves initially, but eventually anger, a sense of having of injustice, of lies having been spread about him. For example, a popular lie of his critics was that Lee had offered a, a, a issued a sunrise order on July second for Longstreet to attack. Uh, the Federals at dawn. There's no sunrise order, but it's got repeated enough that is sort of, you know, people began to believe it. So he's embittered by all that. And we see that in process of embitterment culminate in some pretty sharp rebukes against Lee in his memoir. In his memoir, Lee, Longstreet says, in effect, that Lee was off his game at Gettysburg, that Lee's blood was up, that Lee was uh, let emotion get the best of him. Uh, and and underestimated his enemy, overestimated his, his own men, and so on. And what what sort of rankled most in the eyes of of Lee defenders was that Longstreet went the additional step of comparing Lee to Grant, and saying Grant was a superior general. You know, the the Lee's line, the foundation of the lost cause, going back to Appomattox, was the idea that Confederates had been beaten by overwhelming numbers and resources. Uh, that it was a Yankee victory. It was a victory of might over right not of right over wrong. Um, well, Longstreet challenged that, you know, suggested that it was it was it was Grant's genius and moral courage, uh, not just brute force that won the war for the North and that Grant had a quality that Lee lacked. And that was a level headedness, you know, a, 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 an ability to to keep his emotions at bay. 
an equipoise, as Longstreet put it, that 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 uh, you know that that Lee lacked. So all of this, just as you said, to criticize Lee was a sort of unforgivable uh, uh, sin. Uh, that, you know that that it wouldn't have been enough to to put Longstreet in such bad stead in the eyes of his critics if 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 the politics hadn't come first. But they put the two things together, and and they you know developed a story about his perfidy, you know, and his his his. Uh, his his uh, you know treason against the lost cause essentially um that that was very powerful um you know now he succeeds it is to a certain extent in his georgia years in in rehabilitating his reputation in the eyes of some white southerners um but but um but but the critics never let, let up and and long after longstreet passes as I, as i said these debates you know churn on and on and on You've mentioned his political career beyond um, Reconstruction that went on, and in fact, you talk about his – he served as a U.S. marshal. He served yeah. as U.S. minister to Turkey, and you yeah. don't skimp on that. You talk about how he performed in those roles, how he got – those jobs and how he tried to continue to and sort of insinuate himself into every Republican presidential administration. Absolutely. And it's very important to note, you know, uh, uh, thinking about Georgia politics in particular. So after Reconstruction, the Georgia Republican Party is 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 on its heels. I mean, because of all of the tactics, Jim Crow tactics, infamous Jim Crow tactics that we know so much about. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, Georgia Republicans have very little chance of, of, of holding any, any real power. The only access to power is when the Republican presidents in office and federal patronage can, can be brought into the picture. So Longstreet considers himself to be a sort of dis important dispenser of patronage, uh, and, and he sort of mentor to some black politicians who seek some of these, uh, these federal patronage posts. And he himself is quite successful in securing them. And I, I get into them in part because I think some previous studies have imagined that these things were uninteresting. U.S. Marshal, what does that mean? Well, you, you know, U.S. Marshals not only, you know, track down tax evaders and whiskey distillers and so on. They were supposed to protect voting rights, you know, uh, and he gets embroiled in a, in a case of when a clan like group attacks some African-Americans in Banks County and Longstreet's Marshall's office is in charge of tracking them down. A case goes all the way to the Supreme Court to hold them accountable. The, the Ottoman Empire thing was fascinating. This was, uh, you know, you asked about empathy. The one personal connection I had to all this was, of all things, my father was Turkish from uh, Istanbul. And the fact that there was a Turkish component to this story I thought, well, that's that's just that's kind of cool, uh, uh, you know, not 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 what you would expect. So what makes it interesting was only in Istanbul for six months. But what makes it fascinating is to think about the symbolism of it. He was named as an ambassador in 1881 to represent the United States abroad. This is less than, you know, 16 years after he led an army that tried to destroy the Union. You know, and to look at this through the eyes of, for example, the European press that commented on this appointment and on Longstreet's being invested by the Sultan with his credentials and so on. And the French and British papers were apoplectic, like these Americans are crazy. How do you, you know, how, how did this, how does this come to be that someone can represent a country that they that they fought just, you know, less than two decades before to to destroy? Um, so it, it it that is just again a credit to the fact that he he. Um, he secures these posts because he is seen as politically useful to the Republican Party, uh, and and he makes himself useful to them, um, and and that's and that you know uh, then conveniently for him ties into his efforts in this kind of third phase of his life to reinvent himself as a champion of reconciliation. You mentioned his years in Gainesville. You say that basically from 1876 until his death in 1904, yeah. he, Gainesville was sort of the center of, of his political world, his all of his life. Um, his first wife died in 1889. She's buried there in Gainesville where he is. And then yeah. he remarried. Yeah. <laughs> as, as you note, to a woman who was 42 years his junior, he was 76. Tell us a little bit about Helen Dorch Longstreet. Yeah, fascinating. So she was, a, a as it turns out, a political maverick in her own right, much younger than Longstreet, a journalist. Father had been a journalist. She was a, 
uh, a, a journalist already of some of some note uh, and 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 of ambition, uh, ambition to play a role in the state government, the state library system, for example, and and to to um, be a, 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 a you know journalist who exposed uh, as she saw it over the course of her career, um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, sort of a corruption and 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 was a was a, a you know truth teller that's how, how she she would have saw saw her journalism career um so they they marry as you can imagine the marriage is seen through a political lens like everything else about Longstreet it, the, the the Republicans see the marriage as a sign of his continued vitality you know the Democrats see it as something that's that's you know morally reprehensible you know gold digging cradle robbing sort of you know uh, a stunt of some kind the two the Helen Dorch Longstreet and, and and James defend the marriage they claim it's a partnership of equals and so on she will go on to defend his military record very vociferously she is not um, during the years of their marriage before his death in 1904. I, we wouldn't describe her as progressive at all on the issue of race. Her, she, her real main concern is to rehabilitate him in the eyes of Confederates by suggesting he had been a faithful Confederate uh, all along. Um, but then surprisingly, she has her own kind of uh, her own uh, sort of awakening during the era of the world wars, first world war and second world war, by the end of the second world war, she serves at the bell bomber plant in Marietta as a Rosie, the riveter type in her very old age at that point, by the end of the second world war, she's going on record very vociferously in Georgia politics, um, you know, advocating black voting and black civil rights um, and, and, and becomes a sort of heroine. Uh, 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 you know, in the eyes of some of some uh, you know, black civil rights activists in, in, in the South and, and, and even in the North and her own turnaround, as we were laughing before I, I we, we started this conversation, somebody needs to write a biography of her and it needs to be someone who understands that that period of the two world wars very well, because it's black military service to the United States in those wars. That is the the heart of her own conversion and her sense that this is, uh, you know, that again, uh, they have earned uh, civil rights and voting rights and, and and a place in the polity and so on. So her own journey is 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 uh, you know is fascinating in its uh, in its own right and and um, um, you know it means in effect if you think about Longstreet born in 1821 and Helen Dorch Longstreet who dies in 1962, you put the two lives back to back and there is a kind of uh, you know, saga of 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 the South. You know that that the two stories together tell. And again, you know, in her her own journalistic career, she she considered herself somewhat of a preservationist and environmentalist. Um, uh, uh, eventually, comes to support women's suffrage very vocally. So there's a journey of her own that that's you know someone ought to <laughs> ought to ought to really uh, trace carefully. But it won't be you. It won't be me. No, no, no. <laughs> So Longstreet dies in 1904. She dies in 1962. Um, and in between, there's, of course, a whole host of biographies written about the Confederate chieftain Robert E. Lee, chief among them, of course, Douglas Southall Freeman, many others. Right. Yeah. Um, and but but you you take us all the way through to the really the beginning of the rehabilitation of Longstreet's reputation, yeah. which you chart as being 1974's Killer Angels by Michael Shara. Yeah. which was then turned into a movie, right? 20, 20 years yeah. later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that there is, you know, for, for Shahar and some some others, Longstreet and Lee represent this kind of, you know, passion play, Lee representing a sort of uh, older, sentimental, romantic, and somewhat outdated uh, view in Longstreet, a more kind of clear-eyed uh, realism um, that that rehabilitation had to do with Longstreet's military uh, record and performance, uh, and and you know it, it, uh, uh, the rehabilitation was by no means uh, sort of complete in the sense that Longstreet has had his critics since then um, among scholars who feel that his uh, that he made you know many many blunders in his in his military uh, military career. Um, you know, to me, the the interesting uh, sort of uh, uh, part of this is to think about. The ways that Longstreet tried to jumpstart a rehabilitation while he was alive and how he 
it was the theme of reconciliation or reunion that enabled him to kind of begin that um, that work. He sort of refashioned himself in the last years of his life as, as, a, as a champion of the, the reconciliation of North and South, as a guy who had been able to see long before others could that both sides were going to have to yield some and make some concessions if there was going to be reunion. Um, uh, uh, and, and he had some partners in this. One of the Georgia aspects of the story I've really tried to bring to light is that entities like the Atlanta Constitution and and its powerful editor Henry Grady, you know, really saw him as useful. You know, wanted wanted to kind of sign him on with their new South agenda, wanted to neutralize him politically, sent him various messages that that you know he could be restored in the eyes of white Georgians if he if he just backed off his politics some, um, and and they he sort of played a cat and mouse game with them. You know, they made sort of mutual use of each of each other. Um, so he was able to, by the time of his death, uh, 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 claw back some of his lost popularity among white Southerners, which is uh, which which is interesting. And and much of that had to do with an increasing willingness, especially as he got older and seemed less of a political threat, uh, uh, an increasing willingness of people to compartmentalize and say, OK, your political career is over in one box and your military career is in the other and 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 uh, a willingness to praise him for his military career and kind of put his political career off off to the side. So um, so he he, you know, uh, sort of gets that underway Um Helen Dorch Longstreet wades in after she dies because she's very well aware that without Longstreet around to speak for himself and to parry the blows of his critics, you know, that 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 um, that effort at self rehabilitation could easily be be unwound. Uh, and so, we, you know, we see we see sort of peaks and valleys in his in his in his uh, military reputation. And again, part of the point of my book is to say, you know, as interesting as all of that is, um, to think about Longstreet, the public man, Longstreet, the public figure, Longstreet, the prolific commentator on American politics, that long career that's a window into Reconstruction and its demise and the Jim Crow era and the and the, the cult of reconciliation. Um, you know, all of that is just as interesting, you know, believe it or not, <laughs> as 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 uh, the, the more familiar battles about about Gettysburg. You end by saying Longstreet's story is a reminder that the arc of history is sometimes bent by those who had the courage to change their convictions. As we live through the era now where we're seeing a complete um, – pretty thorough if not complete um, way – difference in – revision in the way that the public sees the Confederacy. Right? We've seen statues and monuments coming down, names coming off of military bases – uh, the idea that at long last the reconciliation is coming apart um, because it was forged right over the rights of African Americans. Yeah. Does Longstreet look different to us now? Not only because he did have the courage to change his mind, which we always, yeah. well, at least we used to admire people like that. Right. But does he look different because of the lens we're seeing him through now? Also, because yeah, the Confederacy. You know, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, before this biography was published, over the course of the past few years as we've been grappling with these issues of memorialization uh, and and memory uh you know a, a number of people have written you know editorials and op-eds and so on asking the sort of obvious question where are the monuments in the south to james longstreet what does the absence of those monuments mean outside of gainesville uh, uh, uh you know none to be found in the south and he's been held up many times as the exception that proves the rule that is to say those monuments were monuments to white supremacy, to Jim Crow, uh, 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 you know, to, to 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 the racial politics of the Confederacy. And and proof uh, of that is that is that Longstreet, who was not useful as a symbol of any of those things, uh, though he had been a very important military leader, wasn't memorialized in, in, in that way. So we, we, we are uh, all that's happened in the past 10, 15 years has sort of primed us to to recognize the significance of this, you know, he's he's relevant uh, to and we we see him, I think, as a number of op eds have, has have uh, noted in a new light because of January 6 insurgency. There were, you know, people drew parallels not in, incorrectly between 
January 6th and things like that, Canal Street Battle of 1874 that I mentioned, and 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 uh, there are lessons about the about accountability, the need to hold insurgents accountable, and so on that can be drawn uh, from that from that uh, comparison. You know, to me, Longstreet was, for all the limits of his racial egalitarianism, and they're very important to recognize, he was a clear and present danger to lost cause orthodoxies. And what the lost cause, as you said, the lost cause at its heart was the argument that the cause was not lost, but that that which had been lost on the battlefield could be won by various forms of political prescription and racial prescription. Um, but the lost cause was also a screen that was meant to hide Southern history in all of its complexity from Southerners to suggest that there was one history, the official history, the history of a solid South a solidly Confederate South and of of, uh, of of whites and blacks alike who made all the necessary sacrifices from start to finish in a cause that was doomed by by you know Yankee brute might, uh, but that was morally flawless and destined to be vindicated uh, uh, and and uh, after the war by the by the defeat of Reconstruction. In a sense, all of those statues were screens hiding history from us because they made room only for that story, not for all the other stories, the stories of dissent, the stories of a South divided against itself. You know, I'm, I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. We've grappled with these with, with these issues in, in a way uh, unlike any other uh, place. And, and uh, the history of a divided South, I mean, you know, our very shorthand, the South lost the Civil War. Well, you know, 200,000 African-American men fought for the Union Army and 80 percent of them were Southerners. You know, uh, uh, occupation it, through one set of eyes is liberation through, through another. You know, the South was divided. There were these fault lines in the region. They've always fascinated me. Uh, and, and Longstreet represents those, you know, th those uh, those those fault lines. And so he remains relevant for that reason, too. And part of the, the moral of this story is that that monolithic history is not only a, a, a distortion that's been put to some really pernicious uses, but it's also, you know, far less interesting than 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 the true complicated history of of of, of a region divided against itself. My last question to you is: is again, as a biographer, recently I read an article by Robert Massey, who uh, is deceased now, but he was the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Peter the Great and many others. Ah. He talked about the um, the connection, as I mentioned earlier, that one makes uh, to their subject after spending so much time with him. He talked about how reluctant he was, how it was almost like a, the death again of Peter the Great. Um, and and I've read other, of other biographers who very reluctantly let their subject go when it comes time. Did you have any problem letting go of James Longstreet? I mean, that's a that's a great question. I would say the answer is no, in part because I, I, I have experience of writing a previous biography. So in the case of the Van Lu biography, I, I had much more, much more empathy for her than I than I did for for Longstreet. It was hard to let go of that one. But I discovered that you can let go, move on to the next project. But the biography doesn't let go of you because new information comes to light. I mean, I, I you know, I, I hazarded a whole theory in the Van Lu book about her the identity of some of her co-workers and some and various things and 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 people were sending me sources years later saying because you know uh, uh, hey we're all everyone you know no one gets the last word we're all still digging you know and based on the digging you did we've done some additional digging and lo and behold here's some new stuff that to learn so i i i i'm very keenly aware that i'm not done learning about long street that I, you know i hope this biography would 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 uh would be the, be a beginning, not an end point, and that and that people will come along and build on it and dig deeper into aspects of it. Uh, I mean, the Helen Dorch Longstreet story is just one obvious example. Uh, aspects of it that I, 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, didn't get into. And uh, another way in which my experience pays off is I know now, after many years in the trenches, just turned sixty. Uh, that you know the only way to let go of a project is to is to get enthusiastic about the next one you know so it can it can kind of draw you and as we as we were you know saying before we 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 hit uh, the the green button here on this interview I've started a new biography of Clara Barton you know the world famous Civil War nurse and humanitarian long epic life that you know uh, is is going to be extremely challenging to 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 tell the story of. Um, 
you know, overlaps chronologically with Longstreet's and with and with Van Loo's, but takes me into all kinds of other worlds because the Red Cross was an international, you know, organization. So um, I, I'm I'm letting the siren song of Barton, you know, sort of sort of uh, steer me into some new waters here, and that's and that's uh, I think turning out to be a to be a good thing. Well, if that one is as good as this one, it's going to be uh, it's going to be saying a lot, and I'm sure it uh, will be. Elizabeth Varon, author of Longstreet, the Confederate General Who Defied the South. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for the interview. I really appreciate it. The hardest working producer and engineer in show business, the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS two-handed tennis team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our director of communications and staff pediatrician is Keith Pinstripe Stragero. The GHS director of classroom indoctrination is Amy Standardized Test Snyder. The captain of the GHS Italian wine tasting team is Rebecca Beerstein Bretina. Our GHS Director of Bean Counting and Big Brother Surveillance is Greg Eye in the Sky Durkin, assisted by our Accounts Payable Administrator, Imelda Checks. The Director of the GHS Civil War Beard Division is Nate Brickwall Jackson Peterson. Our Off the Eaton Path Fact Checker is Ella Fino. The GHS Opera Critic is Barbara Seville. The Off the Eaton Path Staff Bookshelf Maker is L. Ron Cubbard. Our Director of Employee Loyalty is Upton Leftus. Our staff layoff specialist is Harry Verderchi, assisted by layoff counselor Oscar LaVista. Our Off the Eaton Path HR Director is Stella Payne Diaz, assisted by our Deputy HR Director, Royal Payne Diaz. The GHS Russian intern this year is Igor Beaver. The Off the Eaton Path Elvis impersonator is Amal Shookup. Our staff director of Three Stooges Studies is Lee Iapoka. Dr. Todd Gross's personal eBay specialist is Selma Junkoff. And our off the eaten path martini mixer, as always, is Olive Twist. You can find our podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com. It's a new website. Check it out. And the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Be sure and like Off the Deaton Path on Facebook as well. Please also visit DeatonPath.GeorgiaHistory.com and check out our videos, Dispatches from Off the Deaton Path, my blog, and similar redeemed rebel podcasts like this one. Stay safe, stay strong. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>